Okay, so we're going to make a right up here onto Hempstead Street here in New London. All right, got it. Oh, I see a park on our left. Yeah, and that's our destination. This is Williams Memorial Park Historic District. Now you can park anywhere and we can just walk over. Was well, a nice little park here in the middle of New London, Connecticut. There's an eight-story apartment building off to our right a little ways. Mm -hmm. We're walking along a sidewalk pathway through the middle of the park. Bunch of trees. I'm sure this is a perfect place for a stroll or a picnic in the summer. Well, almost perfect. Well, why is that? Because this land wasn't always a park, apartment building, and upscale housing on the other side of that apartment building. Well, what was it before? This land used to be the town's second burial ground. Oh, no. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> so the cemetery was established in 1793, but as New London expanded, this eventually became prime real estate. Nope, nope. I don't like this one bit, Jeff. <laughs> so the cemetery was relocated just down the street to make way for the park and new housing. But there are rumors swirling that in some cases, they only moved the headstones. I'm Jeff Belanger, and welcome to episode 327 of the New England Legends podcast. Hello, I'm Ray Osher. This is a unique episode because if you keep listening at the very end, I have a special treat for you. A short audio excerpt from my new book, The Fright Before Christmas, Surviving Krampus and Other Yuletide Monsters. It's available now in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook, narrated by yours truly. The book is available anywhere with links to buy it in our episode description, and keep listening at the end to hear some of the audiobook. Special treat for New England Legends podcast listeners. Hey, did you know most of our story leads come from you? Well, this one did. We got this email from Alexis G, who wrote, Hello, from Florida. I visit New London, Connecticut once a year to see my family and friends. There's an interesting thing about Williams Memorial Park. It used to be a cemetery. The headstones are now down the road. Legend is, they only moved the headstones. I'd love to know if this is true or not. Well, here we are looking into it, Alexis. That we are. And we'll get to it right after this quick word from our sponsor. Okay, Jeff, I've seen this movie before. You moved the cemetery, but you left the bodies, didn't you? But you left the bodies and you only moved the headstones! Ah, yes, the 1982 movie Poltergeist, a classic, mm. written by Steven Spielberg and starring Craig T. Nelson. In the movie, a fancy housing development was built over a graveyard, and that's why the Freeling family's new home was already haunted when they moved in. The developer moved the headstones, but not the graves. Who would do such a thing? Right. Who would do such a thing? So some people believe this happened here at Williams Memorial Park Historic District. They only moved the headstones? That's the legend. And we're going to get to the bottom of it. Uh, first, a little more on Williams Memorial Park Historic District. Okay. The whole four-acre site is bordered by Hempstead Street, where we part, Broad, Mercer, and William Street, too. There are historic houses on Broad and Cottage Streets that are part of this district that was established in 1885. In 1987, the district was added to the National Register of Historic Places. Got it. So let's head back to 1885 and see what this park looked like back then. It's the spring of 1885 here in downtown New London, Connecticut. Grover Cleveland is in the White House, and New London is in a period of expansion. The whaling business has been good to New London. The city is located at the mouth of the Thames River, where it pours into Long Island Sound. Between whaling and shipping, industries are growing. Some locals are growing wealthy, and the town is expanding. Here at the Second Burial Ground, located across the street from the Second Congregational Church, some nice homes are starting to encroach on the boneyard and the stone quarry located on the far side. What was once the outskirts of town is turning into prime real estate. Sure, but have some respect for that dead, Jeff. Right. Burial places are sacred. It's true in almost every culture, but the living will always take precedent. Time and tide wait for no one, not even the dead. The burial ground was first used in 1793, Mary Rice was the first to be interred. Now, back in 1793, New London looked very different. At first, the population was about half of what it is now, and there weren't near as many buildings and homes. Almost a century later, New London is on the move. Enter the Honorable Charles Augustus Williams. Williams had been the director of the New London Cemetery Association, and now he's the mayor of New London. Charles Williams is wealthy. He has a vision for New London. 
He knows that cities often have a public park in the center while the city sprawls outward and upward. New London is sprawling. He doesn't think it's right that the center of town now features a boneyard and quarry. And Mayor Williams is willing to put his money where his mouth is. What do you mean? Well, the mayor is willing to personally guarantee the price tag for relocating all the bodies from second burial ground to the newer Cedar Grove Cemetery on the outskirts of town. And he'll pay to get the land graded into a public park after. He believes a park will draw in more investments in developers. No one wants to live next to a cemetery. Mm, I get it. So a public notice is put forth that these bodies are being moved from the burial grounds. 770 graves in total. If you have a loved one interred here, you have the option of having them move to a different cemetery at your own expense, or the city will relocate the grave at Mayor Williams' expense. Pretty soon, the work begins. The work takes about a year. Caskets and headstones are pulled up from the ground here and moved a little over a mile to Cedar Grove Cemetery. As you can imagine, it's quite a sight to see. Neighborhood kids love to watch and gawk at the gruesome job. Cedar Grove Cemetery was established in 1851, still has plenty of room to accommodate the needs of New London. When Cedar Grove was established, it was called the city's permanent cemetery. In fact, some locals had already paid to have their loved ones exhumed from here at Second Burial Ground and moved over to Cedar Grove. Mayor Williams is really just finishing the trend. By 1886, any graves not spoken for by families were exhumed and moved over to Cedar Grove. The total cost for this project is about $8,000. Fortunately for Mayor Williams, two other prominent local people, Mrs. Anna Haven Perkins and Mrs. Chapel, join in to add funds for the park project. But Mayor Williams foots most of the bill. With the second burial grounds now cleared and graded, a new park is dedicated. And who better to name it after than Mayor Williams? And so, Williams Memorial Park is born. And that brings us back to today. Okay, so do we think that they took all the graves or just moved the headstones? Right, right. So to answer that, first, let's head a mile or so up Broad Street and check out Cedar Grove Cemetery. Wow, Cedar Grove Cemetery is huge. And check it out. It's pretty obvious where the moved headstones from Second Burial Ground are located. Yeah, it is. You can see there's hundreds of headstones very close to each other in neat rows. Yep, that's the graves from Second Burial Ground. Now, I'm not going to count them all, but I wouldn't argue if someone told me all 770 are here. Right, there are obviously hundreds of them. Which, again, begs the question that was asked of us in the beginning, did they get them all, or are there still a few bodies buried under Williams Memorial Park today? Okay, right, so that. Yeah, you know, the the reason we're here? (laughs) Right. So to answer that, let's head back to Williams Memorial Park. So I dove into the newspaper archives and got a copy of the December 21st, 1946 New London Evening Day newspaper, where someone asked the very same question. They had heard the headstones were moved, but not the bodies. All of this came about because some folks in New London wanted to repurpose Williams Memorial Park to be the site of a new civic center. Now, many people opposed the construction project because they wanted to keep the place a public park. Besides, they reasoned, this park is still burial grounds. Well, how did they figure that? Well, for one, in 1938, a hurricane passed through New London and uprooted some of the trees in the park. I know where this is going. Again, thanks to the movie Poltergeist. (laughs) Right. So the tree topples over and suddenly some human bones come to the surface. Okay, so maybe a few graves were missed during the move. Maybe, but if we're to believe the reports, and I do, more than a few were not moved. Well, how many were you talking So Frederick W. Mercer, the vice president of National Bank of Commerce in New London back in 1946, was quoted in that article as recalling watching the removal of bodies from the cemetery when he was a young man. Yeah, well, that checks out. When I was a kid, if I heard they were moving a bunch of bodies from a local graveyard, I would have watched that too. (laughs) Right? Uh, So would I. So go ahead and read the last part of this article citing Frederick Mercer. Okay, it says, quote, it is his recollection that about 770 persons were buried in the second burial ground, and he insists that no more than 70 bodies were ever removed, indicating that some 
700 still remain. 700, Jeff. 700 or, you know, 90%, the overwhelming majority, all right under our feet. How does that happen? So the first time I saw the movie Poltergeist was with my dad. And I remember him telling me that, hey, this is fiction. You know, (laughs) it would never happen. They would never move just the headstones and not the graves. Well, guess what, Dad? After doing the work that I do for the last 25 years, I can tell you, it happens all the time. Really? So when you see an old burial ground, you see the headstones. Right. There's a chance there's a casket containing the person named on the stone just below. It does happen. Yeah. What also happens is old-time grave diggers working for minimum wage and handheld shovels dig into the ground and hit a big rock or, or ledge. So they move over a few feet. Or they recall the guy they buried last week had plenty of soft dirt, so they dig him up again and lay the new casket right on top of the old one. So so if you're going to dig up a bunch of graves to move them and you don't find the casket beneath the headstone, you're probably not going to break your back digging up acres of land looking for it. Nope. You move the headstone and you call it a day. Yep. So people stroll the Williams Memorial Park, have picnics here, and all the other things people do in public parks, and all of that is on top of hundreds and hundreds of dead bodies. Right. And now I'm glancing over at that apartment building and some of the nearby houses and wondering if they're here. Oh, they're here. Which brings us to After the Legend, where we dig deeper into this week's story, and sometimes we find a corpse, and sometimes we go way off course. After the Legend is brought to you by our Patreon patrons. We dig this group of (laughs) amazing people who support us with all the costs it takes to bring you two stories each week. We can't do it without these insiders who get early ad-free access to new episodes, plus bonus episodes and content that no one else gets to hear. We'd consider it a holiday season gift if you join us there. It's just three bucks per month. That's like buying me and Jeff a beer yeah. that we have to split them. Right. Just head over to patreon.com slash New England Legends to sign up. And to see some pictures of Williams Memorial Park, just click on the link in our episode description or go to the website and click on episode 327. And be sure to stay tuned for the audio excerpt from my new book, The Fright Before Christmas, after we're done. Poltergeist. Poltergeist. Yeah, great Toby, movie. Toby Hopper. I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name. He directed Chainsaw Massacre Guy. Oh, yeah, nice. that's his movie. And Steven Spielberg wrote, wrote or produced. Wrote it. Wrote, he wrote it. it. Yeah, legit scary. When I, I mean, when I was a kid, I was young. Watched it when I was thirteen on my thirteenth birthday. Oh, with about ten or twelve friends, mm-hmm. and we all freaked out during the skin. No, oh, in, in yeah, the mirror yeah. when he's ripping his skin off. Yeah, I remember we all ran to the bathroom, pretended we were throwing up, and. <laughs> It was a, made a big deal out of it. But yeah. yeah, that was a scary movie. The clown scene got me. Great movie. Yeah. Uh, great movie. And and because I love the idea of playing with the haunted house trope. Haunted houses have to be old and scary. Right. And, and bad things happen there. And you're like, nope, this is brand new construction. Yeah. Uh, new development. Like, I, I think they were still developing. Yeah, they're they in still that putting up some houses. Yeah. And you're like, no, no, everything. Well, how could it be haunted? It's brand new. And it... it it, shook it up and it was also a uh, a fun spirit whatever was in there was you know playing with the with the, uh, chairs, the chairs and yeah. it, like it, nobody was scared it wasn't a big deal until yeah <laughs> a little old lady showed up and said come to the light yeah uh, i love it hey i want to comment on something when you named the river in new london connecticut yes yeah the Th- thames thames the thames thames if you want to pronounce it like the local okay it is the thames river Not spelled thames. t-h-a-m-e-s exactly the same spelling as the one over in london right. england old london any of our british friends who are listening must have bristled must have uh, absolutely <laughs> uh, because of course over there it is the thames yes it is the thames but uh it is intentionally pronounced what did i say thames I don't know. It is the it's Thames. Thames. It's That's the right. Thames. Not even closely spelled to what it sounds like. Right. Thames. Yeah, it's the Thames in London. But, T-E-M-S. But Thames, if you're Thames. in New London, and I think part of that might have been, uh, there's a couple things at work. Could have been political protest back at the time of colonial days when you're yeah. breaking away from England. Like, we'll show you. This isn't the Thames. We don't call it that. This is the Thames, right? Or it could be that you're just so far removed from you know, a whole country that's called it the Thames for so long. Well, they saw the way it was spelled and they said, well, let's do it correctly. <laughs> let's spell it the way, let's pronounce Thames. it the way it's spelled, Thames. <laughs> so uh, anyway, and don't even get me started about the Boston Celtics basketball team. I won't. Okay, good. We'll just skip You want to talk away. about the Patriots instead? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, all we have is 
But Which, we don't even have high school football. That's all done. The oh, Bruins are good. I guess, yeah. yeah the Bruins are good. And, the, and I guess the, the, the Celtics are doing well. Yeah. So we've got that. Um, but anyway, so uh, also something else I wanted to uh, mention. From episode 325, we talked about uh, the fountain in front of um, the Providence Athenaeum. Mm. And we called it the Bubla. And, the Bubla. And I yeah. said very much a Massachusetts thing. We got multiple uh, emails from people in Wisconsin who mm. said, we call it a bubbler out here in Wisconsin as well. But we call it a bubbler. Bubbler. Yeah, it may be spelled the same. And uh, our buddy Hatch, who uh, comments on just about every single episode, we appreciate it. Uh, he said the origin of the bubbler, it's from the old five-gallon water fountains that would bubble when you oh, sure. fill them up. Makes boop, boop, sense. Yeah, which totally we have makes sense. Work. Which, you know, and then it became the, the water fountain, but we just stuck with the old name, the bubbler. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thanks, Hatch. Thanks for everybody that... I, I love when we you, you make a comment that you think is next to nothing, and yeah. then people are like, but in Wisconsin, we do it too. And I'm like, I love it. Thank you, Wisconsin. Our... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll we'll put you as part of New England in the next round when we add a state. I can't wait to find out where I can find a hot poker, which is a reference to the vault that's coming out soon. Right. So you'll have to listen that's to that to get that reference. Coming out on Monday. <laughs> right. Yeah. Tune in for that. Um, but yeah, no. So so moving the headstones, I've worked on tons of stories over the years. And at first I thought Poltergeist was just a work of fiction. Yeah. But no, truly, like the people that have to dig up graves and move them don't make a ton of money. Right. And it's backbreaking and it's awful. And they also didn't have the machinery back then to right. do it. You had a shovel. Yeah. And you had to go down six feet. Yeah. You know? Uh, and back then it was even more important to go down six feet because there's diseases. Yeah. Now you get embalmed, like you're pretty well, you know, you're, you're pretty cleansed by the right. time you go, you go on the ground these days. But but back then, yellow fever or something, like you wanted people to be down six feet. And and so yeah, if you're digging up a cemetery, my goodness, I did a story on the Pittsburgh Carnegie Library, and it was they were expanding the library, and that used to be the pauper's grave out mm. back, and they moved the cemetery, or so everyone thought, and then they started to expand the building, and the earth movers come in and start digging through the oh. ground, and they're just cracking caskets open like eggs, heads skeletons and skeletons and, are oh, rolling out, and geez. and everything else, and they're like. Okay, so they just move the headstones. It just happens again and again and yeah. again. Well, it's the easiest you. thing to do. It's the cheapest thing to do. I did a story um, on the Quabbin Reservoir for my mm. book, Weird Massachusetts. And the Quabbin, if you, it's the giant body of water that's basically Boston's drinking water mm. in the central Massachusetts. And they flooded four towns. Right. Uh, four towns had to be evicted. Um, everybody was evicted. I remember my dad telling me you could go out on the lake and see like church steeples. I've heard that too. It's not true. It's not. Um, they removed every building, every tree, everything. Uh, this you can go to the museum there, and they'll, they'll you can see pictures mm. of the, the barren land. Everything's been removed. I talked to an old timer who was one of the kids that was evicted from his town, and he said he remembers walking through what was left a few days before they started to flood the valley. And he said um, he walked to the old gro graveyard at where they, they had moved all the graves to, and I've been to that graveyard, they've moved them all. And he said, when he walked in, he said, I saw little uh, rectangles um, where all the headstones had been lifted, but I was like, hmm, there's no holes dug for the graves. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Boston, enjoy your next sip of drinking water. <laughs> it's been filtered through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds wow. of corpses. Uh, How did they let that go? Like, we'll take the headstones, we'll leave the, the, the mark that the headstone made. Because it is an impossible task to right. dig up an old but cemetery. They could have hidden it. They could have filled in those rectangles just so nobody would know. But it's very obvious. You took the headstone. There's, you didn't dig anything else up. That sounds like extra work to me, right? Uh, right? You're giving people from the past too much credit. <laughs> they were lazy too, right? Have you ever tried to dig a hole, by the way? Yes. It's not very easy. I've put in a retaining wall. I've, I've dug up uh, a patio in my backyard. Yeah. It is, it's brutal. And you know, even an inch, because I did it with a fire pit, yeah. and that takes forever. Yeah, because Massachusetts, our most abundant resource is rocks. Yes. Right? <laughs> and so you start digging into the ground, and you get like two, three inches down, and you hit a rock, oh. a big one, right? Like the size of a basketball. And those yeah. are heavy, you know? Yeah. And so you got to dig around it, and you got to dig it out, and you got to like roll it somewhere. Horrible. So, so when you see these colonial walls all over New England, the reason you see that is because as farmers were trying to you know, move dirt to, to create farm fields, yeah. they just hit hundreds and hundreds and thousands and millions of these rocks. So they would roll them to mark the property lines. Oh. And that's why those those stone walls are not really well built. They're just piles of rocks. Right. Because you're just getting them out of your field. Yeah. Every year you till it, you're probably, how many, how many um, you know, tills have you broken? Sure. On those giant rocks. So, wow, that's crazy. So yeah, we have tons and tons of rocks, which means our cemeteries, probably more than many other parts of the country, um, I 
promise you, those, the headstone marks maybe sort of near where oh, that person is. So weird. And again, possible. They're, <laughs> they're below it. It is absolutely possible. It does happen. Yeah. But, and then if you ever said like, pick an old boneyard where the graves go back 100 years, 200 years, and say, we're going to move it. Mm. Oh, even today, even today, they wouldn't get all the caskets. Have you heard any recent stories of this happening? Well, I hear they're going to put in this housing development. <laughs> Craig, right behind you. Craig T. Nelson's going to come in <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're going to, I don't know, and I have not, but, <laughs> but, but, because uh, we've all seen the movie. Yeah. Yeah. At, at this point. Well, I mean, I, look at how they're developing. I mean, there's, every day you see a new development yeah. popping up. Something's in the ground there, whether it's Indian remains. Yeah. Of you course, know, yeah. from years and years ago, or it's a, an old cemetery. Uh, there could be something under the ground. You're ready to buy a new house in a new development and you hear, from the developer, like, yeah, yeah, there was this giant cemetery here, but, mm. but we moved it. Wouldn't you be like, so, so that, that movie Poltergeist is so into the, the, the pop culture, even though it's, it's decades, what, 40 years old, right? Gotta be. It's 40. Yeah. yeah 1982. So it's 40 years oh, there old. there you go. So that movie's 40 years old, but we all know it. And if you were buying a house and you heard, well, this used to be a cemetery, but don't worry, we moved all the graves. <laughs> you'd be like, you know what? I'm gonna just go look. I'm gonna look elsewhere. Right. Yeah. Like you, if you're a developer, you would be insane to put any sort of housing development over an old graveyard. Yeah. Nobody but nobody would buy it unless you're gonna record the fact that you actually did exhume every body. And I promise you, if you were the most careful and conscientious developer in the history of developers, yeah. Uh, you'd miss some. Yeah. You know, even the if the spirit may remain. Maybe the body gets moved, but the spirit could remain. I don't know. I I would I would avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> Altogether. <laughs> Think of yeah. the resale. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like just yeah, be yeah, like, yeah. Ah, location, 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 as they say in real estate. Please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast because it's free and you won't miss a minute of the weirdness. Then tell a friend or two about us. Post a review for us and share our episodes on your social media. It's how we grow. The more we grow, the more people who reach out with their own weird local tales. Email us anytime through our website. We love hearing from you. Also, be sure to keep listening for an excerpt from my new book, The Fright Before Christmas, Surviving Krampus and Other Yuletide Monsters, available now in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook, which you'll hear in just a few seconds. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our Patreon patrons. And our theme music is by John Judd. Until next time, remember, the bazaar is closer than you think. If you're a less than perfect child and you've been told the tales, then December 5th is circled several times in red on your calendar. This is the big day. If you survive to see December 6th, it means you behaved well enough to warrant gifts from St. Nicholas. But if on the 5th of December, you hear rattling chains or bells coming toward your bedroom door during that long, dark, silent, deadly night, it's too late. Krampus has arrived. He's covered in fur, but stands erect on his cloven hooves, though sometimes he has one cloven hoof and one human-like foot, a nod to his demonic origins. Two devil horns sit atop his head, and a long, forked red tongue juts out of his mouth like a serpent. He's wrapped in chains and carries a sack or a basket that he fills with every naughty child he can find. He scoops up the screaming brats, stuffs them into his sack, and carries them back to his mountain lair, where he kills them and eats them. 